This episode of the Southern Hemisphere No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Activista. Activista's mission is to assist growers to develop soil-focused, diverse cropping systems with commercially viable seeds, appropriate equipment and soil inputs, and advice and feedback for all growers' current needs and particular situations. Activista is working diligently behind the scenes to maintain and develop their supply of seeds for profitable market farming. Small bulk quantities are at or near cost price. They have a non-GMO pledge and aim to source the best hybrid and heritage varieties to suit each segment and conditions of growers' needs nationally. Activista takes the battle out of importing specialized tools, providing sales and warranty support with all of their equipment range. They carry most, if not all, parts and have a direct line of communication with suppliers. Activista encourages customer feedback and gives personal attention to all inquiries as they see this process as a vital part of our vibrant, developing, organic community. This next episode is also brought to you by Curly's Ag. Curly's Ag has been in the business of developing and manufacturing innovative ag tools for the past five years. In that short time, they have amassed an impressive range of new and patented tools now readily available for you. Curly's Ag is home to the world's only commercially available battery drill-powered power harrow, as well as Curly's Cracker 2, an automatic broad fork making saw prep and ease in any condition. Curly's Ag is also known for the Elia 3000, a multi-purpose tilter, mulcher and bed former all rolled into one, as well as the most recent and anticipated tool for every farm, the Handy. The Handy is redefining the market garden toolkit and taking the hard work out of farming. It can lift 300 kilograms with ease and smoothly manoeuvre over your garden bed without damaging crops. The Handy's PDO powers the Elia 6000, Mulcher and Tilther, a power harrow, an auger, a compost spreader, a harvester, and more attachments. If you like to know more, please jump on their website at curlyzag.com and feel free to contact them for more information. Curly Zag is distributing in the US and soon opening up in Europe. Welcome back to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Southern Hemisphere Season. My name is Mikey, and today with me, I have Darren Aitken from Vortex Veggies. I have been wanting for a long time to catch up for a one-on-one conversation with Darren after I visited his farm a number of years ago for a workshop and field day. Darren is a passionate and knowledgeable Demeter Biodynamic Market Gardener whose very sharings on, on BD, Biodynamic Farming, has always struck a deep core to me. And it struck a chord both as, I think, a positive challenge to the way I personally farm, but also as a unique possibility of of farming in a very different and, I think, all-encompassing way. So together, Darren and I deep dive into the unique and results-based, which is something we'll talk about a lot, the practice and results-based biodynamic Demeter method, which has been developed and practiced right here in Australia for many, many years. But before we start... I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people, traditional custodians of the land on which we talk today, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening in today. I'm very excited to be chatting with Darren Aitken today from Vortex Veggies. Welcome to the show today, mate. Thank you, Mikey. Pleasure to be on here. Well, let's let's start by painting a brief picture of your farm, where it's located, how much land you cultivate, and a little bit about what you grow. No problem. Um, we've got 16 acres here. Um, we grow mixed uh, vegetables. We've got an acre of greenhouse, so we have mixed greenhouse and field production. So at the moment, for instance, it's the middle of winter, We're harvesting kale, bunching broccoli, celeriac and swedes. And then in the warmer climate, we're doing snow peas, cherry tomatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, cucumber, parsnips. We we make sure we stay quite diverse in the lines we grow. Could you share a little bit about the location where your farm is and just uh, just a point on the climate? Climate. It's always nice for growers to kind of get a, a comprehension, a bit of understanding of, of what the conditions are you're growing in. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm down in the bottom of uh, Australia, in southern Victoria. I guess I'm about 100 kilometres 
west of Melbourne. Our average rainfall would be around about 20 inches. Um, we get all four seasons here. Um, we don't get cold by a lot of world standards. You know, we might cop a frost of minus three or minus four in winter. A daytime temperature of eight or so, that would sort of be our worst winter scenario. Um, but we do get very long, hot, dry summers where a series of days, 40 degrees plus on a normal summer certainly wouldn't be out of the question with a lot of days over 40 expected over the whole sort of summer and early autumn season. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to actually unpacking a bit about the, the dynamic climate that I think we do grow in like we don't sometimes get the colds that you're saying, but we do, we do get across our four seasons quite some some peaks and some lows and it's nice to be nice to explore with you some of the toolkit that you have um, as a grower to to combat or, or to to deal with those things but I, I'd love to first open up with a bit of a story perhaps as I, I remember I first met you actually at one of your open field days a number of years ago and I, I remember quite vividly you telling a story of how you found Alex Podolinski's book in a secondhand store and how it struck a deep chord with you and I was wondering if you could share that story today and also a, a few words about who is Alex Podolinsky. I, you could say, had a part mainstream introduction into horticulture. You know, the, let's just say the, the, chemi the conventional chemical route. I didn't actually finish that schooling because it never resonated with me at all. Um, I was a little bit of a... I guess anti-advertising, anti-authoritarian punk Mikey for a while and um, the organic thing never really stuck with me either because at that stage there was a lot of people with a lot of product to sell. Um, I was in, as you mentioned, a second-hand bookshop and I was looking through the farming section. I found a book called Biodynamic Agriculture Introductory Lectures by Alex Podolinsky. And um, I sat down in the bookshop and my wife was off in some other shop somewhere and I got so entrenched in the book it was actually the first time she'd ever had to come looking for me instead of me going looking to see where she is. So I bought the $2 book, um, read it from front to back and it resonated with me deeply. I said, finally, here's a farming method I can get my teeth into. Uh, I contacted Alex, and I guess parts of the rest of my story might come out today, but Alex Podolinsky is the man responsible for, I guess, bringing the biodynamic method to Australia and developing it into a, a practical results-based um, method where the results um, speak to other farmers. He, he and other farmers founded um, our main farming organisation, which is the Biodynamic Agricultural Association of Australia. Alex devoted his life um, working to develop biodynamics in this country free of charge, um, working farmer to farmer. And I, I guess he, he's partly or more than partly responsible for the stage that our method and our association here has got to today. There's so much to explore on this topic. Um, and I'm really, I'm really excited to delve into the depth because I think a lot of the listeners, you know, those in Australia, those abroad, are very familiar with the word biodynamic by association, but not many of them have either delved into the, the practices um, or have touched upon the theories in the way that, as you're, you're sharing today, have been developed, practiced, tested, and then are now communicated um, under the Australian um, demon community. Um, could, you, could you dive a little bit in as you said, Alex Podolinsky and the work that yourself and others have done have done a, have been mainly focusing on 
taking more from what I understand the BD practice, the biodynamic practice, and applying it in the Australian context for starters. And also, like you mentioned before, which is, I, I hear you say this a lot, and it's always really spoken to me as well, you, you talk about the practical biodynamic method. Yes, well, look, biodynamics, obviously, uh, as a lot of people would know, or, or maybe don't, stemmed from, I guess, one of the last impulses that uh, a fellow called Rudolf Steiner gave in his life. He'd given certain a lot of impulses in certain areas of human endeavour. I mean, education would be one of his main ones, um, anthroposophy, um, architecture, uh, many areas. And I guess this new, what we would call a new impulse in, in agriculture, or at least the foundation for that in a theoretical sense, was given by Steiner towards the end of his life. Um, I must, I, I'd sort of make clear I'm not a Steiner adhert. Um, I'm not an anthroposophist. Um, Alex took the original impulses for a new method of agriculture as given by Steiner and developed them into a practical method that would um, speak to men and women of nature who were already farming. A lot of the stuff given by Steiner was quite esoteric. I guess some people who would be more deeply, or some organisations that were more deeply into Steiner, I suppose we would say approached biodynamics from the clouds down, from that anthroposophical esoteric viewpoint where Alex said about making it a method practical from the ground up. There was many different things I could, I could tell you about that were developed here um, that made the biodynamics successful, but it definitely stems from the outset making the, the quality set of the biodynamic preparations. Um, without the quality biodynamic preparations, you, you can go nowhere. And he combined those with practical and considered um, farming practices, you know, the cultivation, the green manuring, uh, et cetera, et cetera, into the method we have today. Let's, um, let's dive in. Let's, let's go there because I'd love to hear, first of all, like you said, why specifically, like you mentioned before, when you read that book, did it directly speak to you as something finally that you felt you could sink your teeth into? And then through that, I'd like to kind of ask you, where do you think the starting point of the conversation should be in terms of exploring the BD method? I know that it's very difficult to have a conversation about farming with you without you always bringing the conversation back to soil humus. And perhaps that's, that's the point we should be jumping off from. Sure, sure. Well, look, this resonated to me because I saw this as a method to totally... Um, empower the farmer it was about the farmer uh, the farmer's connection to nature and using the preparations and because of the results other farmers had got that I got to see um, through contacting Alex and being put in touch with other farmers that were practicing the method I actually got to see the results that that method could bring so that that spoke to me and grabbed me from the beginning because I saw there was an ability to take very poor pieces of soil and to de develop them into new living, functioning biological soil with the minimum of inputs. And no, no one had anything to sell me. They just had a method to share. And, and that, that, that's partly what grabbed me. And uh, our association works the whole way on a mentor type system, farmer to farmer, with no money exchanging hands. It's, it's a very free system. So I guess, yes, look, soil humus would, would be a place to start, but I always tend to pose the question. I would go back a little step and talk about wanting to farm biologically and perhaps what are the steps we need to do to our soil in the beginning to create the situation for that biology to flourish? Let's start there. Let's start there. I know that's going to be a fascinating point of context to be chatting about. A lot of the, the listeners of the podcast um, 
are fascinated by soil health. We're all very dedicated to understanding ways to be able to farm better. And, and questions in the podcast always come up around the starting point. How do we start? How do we engage with our soil? How do we ameliorate it? How do we create and maintain fertility? So um, I put the, I put the question, yeah, back in, back in your hands. I'd love to hear your, your yeah. answer. Yeah, well, look, I mean, you and I obviously had the odd little chat before um, doing this podcast and – I was aware that this originated as a, a no, no tillage type thing. I'd start from a historical perspective way back uh, as a piece of trivia or an interesting point that the original impulse for ploughing was suggested by an ancient Egyptian called Zoroastra or Zanathustra. He's also known as... And that original impulse was to get light and air um, into the soil. I think that's an important thing to recognise the importance of air into the soil if we want to create the conditions to farm in a biological situation, especially in Australia. And I know in a lot of countries across the world, there's severe compaction there's severe compaction indeed from poor cultivation practices. Essentially, with all types of power, power what we would call power implements, rotary hoes, power harrows, things like that, over time in a lot of soils create the hard pan, uh, a compacted layer. So we, on our farms, when people are first coming into biodynamics, would we walk out in the soil, into the paddock with a fork. We inspect the soil, look for any areas of compaction. This compaction minimises air into the soil and certainly minimises the ability of roots to get down deep and structure the soil. So the first thing we look to do is if we need to relieve compaction is going about that process with um, deep ripping at the appropriate time. This gives the passage for air into the soil and roots to follow. So we consider the soil to be much like us. It's a living, breathing entity and air is one of the most, or we consider air in the soil the most important ingredient in maintaining a biological system. That's that's an amazing observation. I like the pictures you say of light and 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 oxygen. I know oxygen is something which um, is of great importance. Um, aerobic aerobic bacteria and biology is something which has been spoken more and more about in the scientific community regarding soil health. I know it's something that, as you're saying, the biodynamic and the BD community have been talking about for a long time. Um, how, what other farming practices, or if you'd like to delve a little bit deeper into that, the role of supporting oxygen and, and the biology uh, through certain techniques and practices? Sure, sure. Well, of course, once you've um, created the, the situation for air to get in the soil, it's very important that roots follow that as soon as possible. Um, roots are the only thing that will actually structure cultivated soil back and maintain through the structure they'll maintain a good passage of air um, in and out of the soil you mentioned the the biology we bring our biology to the soil of course through what we call preparation 500 which if a lot of people have heard anything about biodynamics it will be oh that stuff that comes out of the cow horns so that's just one of the preparations. There's um, seven other preparations. There's a set of six compost preps that um, – see, one of the, I guess, the important aspects that came out of the biodynamic development here was what we call prepared 500. Um, that's where the 500 and the compost preparations are sprayed out together. I mean, Alex devised – the process of making 500, the compost preps, and a, a further step to enable us to get the whole set of compost preps out over the farm 
easily and, and adequately and efficiently. So that's what we bring our biology with. Um, whenever we're using any type of input, we never introduce water soluble inputs into our system. I guess it's uh, worth trying to explain here what we're effectively trying to do with our biodynamic system is build a substance called humus. Humus is what we consider nature's purest um, plant food. Okay, I'll give a brief explanation of in biodynamics, I guess the fundamental area where we consider agriculture has gone wrong. So it's, you can go back to um, 1850, a German chemist called von Liebig, he discovered that plants can only take in elements in a water-soluble fashion. Now this is a very, very valid scientific discovery, but that discovery led to the development uh, through the Industrial Revolution and onwards to now of highly water-soluble um, plant nutrients, artificial fertilizers. Um, when they're spread onto the ground, and look, I'll, I'll be up front here, raw manure, um, poorly made compost, and organic fertilizers out of the bag, all do this thing they're all highly water soluble so what that does is it saturates the groundwater with nutrient when a plant is growing it has two main functions one is transpiration and the other is photosynthesis transpiration is the uptake of water via the plant roots into the plant the stomata open and the water transpires what happens when you saturate the groundwater with nutrient, whether it be artificial out of a bag or heavy amounts of, of manure, what happens then is for those elements to be water soluble, they're generally salt based. So every time a plant transpires, every time a plant drinks, it's forced to take up nutrient. Within that plant, you've got each individual cell and you've got the osmo osmotic process of the transfer of water to maintain a balance of salt. When the plant transpires, the salt stays in the, the cell. The salt doesn't transpire with the water. Um, as a reaction, the plant automatically says, I need to take in more water, but because the groundwater is saturated with nutrient, it's forced to take in more salt at the same time. This is an ongoing process until the plant reaches a stage that it starts to transpire a little bit less. It holds on to that salt and water, and there you're developing a situation where the plant becomes much more prone to pest attack. Pests love salt and water and to fungal disease. Most, if not all, fungal diseases have an association with overwateriness. So then what happens in a, definitely a conventional system is, surprise, surprise, the same people that have sold you the fertilizer will then sell you the appropriate chemical to deal with the pest or the fungicide. What happens on a nutrient level in that process is as the plant begins to shut down and hold on to more water because it doesn't want to transpire and leave too much salt um, within itself, the process of photosynthesis also slows down because the stomata on the leaf aren't opening so freely to transpire. So then the nutrient within there is not assimilated um, into all the things that as human beings and our animals are looking for out of our plant substances. So that's as, as concise as I guess as I can get it, Mikey, in a, in a nutshell of the way we view the conventional and some organic systems. I can go on with what we're trying to achieve in BD, yeah? Yes, please. Okay.
So what we're actually trying to achieve in BD is to create, everything we do is about creating a substance within the soil called humus. So I call myself a humus banker. I use the biodynamic method to develop the humus bank that the plants will feed off. And all I have to do is maintain the, the bank balance above the level that the, that plants take out on a given season. Um, humus is chemically considered what you would call a colloid. So this is very important. And this is where von Liebig's discovery, which was valid, comes into play. With providing an organic food source to the biology that we provide via the 500, that organic matter is consumed by soil biology and is deposited around soil particles as a substance called humus. The water-soluble elements that a plant needs is encapsulated within that humus. Once that humus is built by biology, the water-soluble elements are trapped within that colloidal humus. They can't leach out into the water. It's, a, it's just built by a biological process. But what does happen is the fine white feeder roots of the plant tap into that, to that water-soluble elements within the humus and they take those water-soluble elements out of the humus. That the process of that occurring is dictated by the sun. So us as humans have our own independent warmth metabolism. Plants don't have that. What actually determines when a plant should begin to feed is the activity of the sun, the sun warmth and the sun light. So when they're provided, the plant will put out fine white feeder roots, tap into the humus, take as much as needed as dictated by the sun. And the groundwater on a biodynamic farm remains unhindered. Um, it's clean of any water-soluble nutrient through any form of fertilizer application. So in, that, in, in creating that scenario in a biodynamic farm, the plants are fed off the water-soluble elements within the humus and the transpiration process of the plant continues unhindered by soluble salt and hence the photosynthetic process remains unhindered as well and the plant has every opportunity to assimilate those nutrients into all the valuable proteins, acids, sugars, starches that we're looking for um, out of our food product and of course gives the plant a lot more resilience in um, dealing with pest or fungal issues because we're not really creating those conditions in the plant for such a thing to occur. I hope that was sort of understandable. You could follow that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, it sparks a thousand and one questions, which I've, I've obviously started jotting down. And, and one of them being, as I've always noted, that for a lot of people, the inter interchangeability between biodynamics and organics um, often in the same sentence starts to become it starts to become more clear some of the fundamental differences as you're as you're describing them largely based upon as you're saying before what sort of fertility or inputs an organic system brings in to feed plants but the moment we start to understand how plants are feeding like you've shared it starts to put into context why a farmer like yourself or farmers in general should be focusing their energy on creating humus, which is essentially the ideal medium for feeding plants. And I was wondering if we could continue to dive into that, essentially how does a farmer, um, a biodynamic farmer or a farmer in general, create humus and create the conditions for making more of it across the farm? We're always looking at... The soil, it's the first thing we look at. Um, as I mentioned before, we're certainly not, when we can see the restructuring ability of the plant roots and in conjunction with the 500, 
Um, we certainly use cultivation in our system. I mean, I, I'm a, a market gardener. I use cultivation implements. So I guess we're, that's what we're we're looking about with continuing to create the conditions for the biology to flourish. Is once we've built that soil structure to, I cultivate minimally, and I think all cultivation is undertaken consciously and with consideration. Um, a biodynamic farmer will only cultivate the soil when the soil is ready. And I, I would say over the 20 odd years I've been farming, I would never have actually cultivated anything the same twice. So it's a matter of developing the techniques to, to do the most appropriate cultivation for your soil if indeed it's needed. Uh, on, on just on that cultivation thing, I, I will make the point that the best, most beautiful, structured, biodynamic soil with permanent humus that I've seen is from uncultivated land on on permanent, well managed permanent pasture. Um, so there's no doubt that that cultivation does damage, but on our scale and size and the situation here we do need to do it and it's always got to be a conscious action and deeply considered with building the humus what we're really looking to do is provide an organic matter food source for the biology we have within our soil to convert to humus in a permanent pasture situation that's done with good rotational management of the pasture um, can be done through slashing uh, and grazing combination or just grazing. So I guess to try and paint a picture of how we would build the humus in a pasture situation, we would consider it essentially an underground green manuring. So let's say we come out of a cold winter the all the pasture begins to grow the roots have a big push downwards in in pursuit of humus um, the roots of our plants go down deep because of the the original cultivation that may have happened in a situation to relieve the compaction before that pasture gets what we call rank before that pasture stops growing it's essential that the farmer has his animals through the, the paddock. Um, so that, in that essence, you, you talk about having paddocks appropriate to the size of uh, the stock you have and not letting any particular paddock on the farm be totally flogged out. So it gets grazed down nicely. What happens when you graze that plant is essentially a lot of the root that that plant had underneath is not required any longer. Um, that dies off to a certain extent. The animals are moved on. The pasture grows back. It, push, it has another push of roots down deep into the soil. That may be grazed again. Those roots die off. So it's that organic matter mass essentially from the roots of course, there's a little bit of influence from uh, manure and whatnot from the animals, but it's that organic matter from the roots that provides the food source for the biology to convert into humus. In a cropping and market garden situation, um, a lot of our farmers here green manure. Even some of our broadacre farmers who might be on three, 4,000 acres um, still use green manure as a, a tool to get large amounts of organic matter into the soil for the soil biology to flourish or for the, for the biology to have a food source to, to create humus. Important with the green manuring is introducing as many species as possible. Um, every, every plant species has a different relationship a different affinity to to different elements um, we're aware of that so we're, we're never growing a monoculture 
green manure. We're actually introducing as many plant species as we can. And with the green manuring situation, it's important not to sow too thickly. Am um, I only using about 10, 10 kilos maximum of mixed seed per acre? Um, we like to let every plant have the opportunity to reach um, its full potential. So it needs a little bit of space. Um, it needs to be able to develop its own expression on top, so to speak, and develop a nice robust root system. So we're looking for a quality aspect in our green manure as well, rather than just a quantity. Um, and also important to recognise what's going on underneath. And I think from a well-grown green manure, there's probably more biomass from the roots than what there is on top. We develop biology quite deeply on biodynamic farms. There was a lot of work done on Alex's farm where we had measurable soil biology down to a metre deep. And that's why we're not shy of, of cultivation. And one of my tools I use is a, a ripper that goes down about 500 uh, millimetres deep. The plant roots follow down to that depth. Uh, and those plant roots down to that depth all get converted to humus by the, the biology down to the depth that we cultivate to. So it's that it's those sort of that process of the, the green manuring after cropping phases and that pasture management that are the main tools that we use to um, build the humus in conjunction of course with the five hundred. There's a few a few things I I'd I want a few directions I'd like to go down. One obviously would be like you just hinted at touching a little bit upon prepared 500 um, and and what it really helps to do to the system. But before then, I wanted to just touch upon an expression that you guys often use, which is plant expression. And I know that a lot of BD farmers um, in your community talking a lot about cultivating um, a sense of awareness and observation when you're out in the field looking at plants and looking for signs of growing in a different way. And I, I, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that that mindset of coming into the field to be able to look and analyse a plant's expression to, to see how it is feeding and how it is interacting or, as you said, hinted before in the cover crop, how a plant is growing to its full expression what does that look like okay look this noticeable difference really comes about from being able to observe i guess you could say a heavily fertilized conventional system and a biodynamic system so with that explanation we gave before about the plant feeding and the plant holding on to a lot of water um a lot of the soluble salts in there are nitrate. So that um, plant will get a really dark, deep blue-green colour. And because it's so full of water, it, it's, it sort of folds over at the edges a little bit and, and hangs down. It, to us, you could say it looks in, in general appearance a little bit sad. Um, a biodynamic plant or, or, or any plant grown without those water-soluble salts, will have a totally different colour. Um, Alex used, used to use the term that our plants are daughters of the sun. You can see the sun inside a biodynamic plant and it gives it a totally different colour than most people have seen. It's a, we call it the biodynamic glow, uh, glow green. And with that plant being weighted down by excess water soluble salts the definition of the leaf edges are what we call very crystalline the plant's very very organized um, in its growth and the, and the overall expression is extremely upright towards the sun it's it's hard to paint a real picture in words whereas we would normally use visuals to 
to show those differences. He will just jumping in here real quick to give a shout out to our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no till growers. This site is the lifeblood of our work and we appreciate so much the support. It makes things like this small series possible and just generally enables us to keep our work free and open to anyone and everyone. We can pay our creators for their work and then keep giving that work away for free. If that's something you believe in, please consider pitching in a few bucks at patreon.com slash no till growers. Also, there are some perks there like first dibs and discounts on merch, books, uh, events we do in the future and at a certain level or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Little Holowaki Farm. Stephen Smith, Scott Snodgrass, and Jean-Martin Fortier. Big thanks to anyone and everyone who supports our work any way that you can. Check out notillgrowers.com slash support for all of our support opportunities. All right, back to the show. It's important what you're sharing though as well, and I think a part of what I why I asked the question is that the topic of, of be, being a farmer, the importance of cultivating inwards those observational skills that intuitive understanding of plants and making sure that we're going out there we're not simply looking at a field to see you know what is our germination success rate um, how clean are the field in terms of weeds but really understanding and looking at the expression of the plant which as I'm what you're hinting at is a very different way of engaging with a plant um, and analyzing in a way which you can understand the, those those health signs or the deficiencies and another thing you hinted at as well is you were talking before about feeder roots. Um, is that something that you do? You go out to the field every now and then? Are you digging out plants and looking at the root systems to, to, to witness that experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's very important to recognize, and Alex recognized this early in the stage, that we, we use the term the plant has essentially two root systems. The old thick browner um, roots are generally involved in the, the water uptake. Um, what is actually tapping in, and you can only really see this in a situation where you've built the humus because if you are got groundwater saturated with water solubles, you'll only have the water uptake roots. There is no function for the other roots that we see in a biodynamic system and we call them the fine white feeder roots and it's those very fine white feeder roots almost microscopic that that are tapping in to the humus that we've built and taking out the elements that the plant requires and so we're constantly digging up you know a green manure or sacrificing a a plant here and there in the field to have a look at that that process and indeed it's that it's that root process that is bringing our cultivated soil rebeating it back and rebuilding the the structure of the soil those fine white feeder roots develop further on to become the older water uptake roots so yes, it's, we're constantly having a look, um, constantly, I guess, monitoring the humus development and the humus levels by observation. Um, anyone coming into biodynamics, the the first thing they notice before any humus is built is that plant expression, and then the development of humus is generally indicated by a darkening. Of the of the color of the soil. That's a very but that's a that's a, a basic um, approach to it. Let's let's maybe jump into an exploration of prepared five hundred. As you as you were sharing before, a lot of people's very shallow understanding of it is simply the um, you know photos they're seeing of of cow horn manure, um, and also a lot of like you mentioned, the more esoteric understanding and theories around the, pre the preparations. So look, pre prepare, um, 500 is the, definitely the foundation. Um, it's what we call our soil spray. It got the name 500. So you see Steiner never made 500. That task was given to uh, Aaron Reed Pfeiffer. 
So Pfeiffer did a lot of work in early work in developing 500 and the other preparations. The reason it was given the name 500 is that Pfeiffer, who was a bacteriologist, he was involved in nutrition. He did a, a work in a lot of good areas, Pfeiffer, but he determined that one gram of the substance that came out of the cow horns had 500 million aerobic bacteria. And so it was just given the name of Preparation 500. There was um, six compost preparations developed um, as well from Steiner's set of lectures. And they were just numbered, um, everything else has been numbered se sequentially. There's a, an atmosphere spray that, which is crushed quartz. Um, it got called 501 and the compost preps are 502 to 507. So the, the, the quality of the biodynamics, as I mentioned earlier, definitely stems from the, the quality of the preparations. And then there's the symbiotic relationship between the preparations and the, the farmer's ability to know how and when to use them. But the quality 500 is important. Um, the process here, we, we, Alex developed the process. We have make 500 on specific farms. Alex bought his property 50 something years ago, specifically for the making of the preparations. Um, ideally, they're made in adversity where there's quite a cold winter. We would put down at Alex's place in each pit around about 250,000 cow horns, um, none touching each other. Uh, the process takes a couple of weeks. We go out and we collect the manure each morning, fill the horns and, and lay them. So look, the quality of the manure is very important, and one of our one of our dairy farmers in New South Wales, um, where the 500s made on his farm, very observant, and he started um, developing his herd with breeding from the best shitters. So he has. <laughs> I, I'm assuming I can say that. So. So he, ha he, he so he he has a quality herd that put out good manure for making quality 500. So look that those horns are laid. Um, we can't really go to huge depth in the time we've got, but they they're buried over the winter in the cold and what comes up in spring. Well, sorry, they're put down in autumn for to be over in the soil over the winter. And what comes up in spring is a black putty-like substance, um, as I said, known, known as 500. The other preparations are made from, the other compost preparations are made from different herbs in different animal parts. And they, it's very important, they too come up as a, as a newly formed colloidal substance, um, un, unrecognizable from the beginning plant part that was used the original indication by Steiner was that the influence of the compost preparations should be out on the land um, before using 500 through the use of compost um, achievable in Europe um, when Steiner first gave the lectures on farms where they were quite small and a lot of labour where the whole family was involved in the farm. Totally impractical in a country like Australia, and Alex saw that from the outset when he got here. Like I say, you know, there might be two people farming 3,000 acres. We don't have the conditions for composting, and the whole composting thing with what we can do with what we call sheet composting is actually a little bit antiquated. Um, so Alex took the step, uh, that step um, of having to apply the preparations on the land before the 500, I guess he effectively took that out through a, a practical sense and took the step, the process of making 500 one step further to make prepared 500. And it's that 
biology that we use to bring a new, I guess, a new impulse to the farm each year. I guess the difference, one of the main material differences between 500 and, let's say, other biological substances that are out there is the the cow manure, the 500, is made anew each season under the influence of that season, under the influence of the planets, where other other microbes that are available in different systems are just perpetuated time and time again. They're just bred from the, from the old microbe. Um, so we see that that, that 500 actually brings to us more than just the biology. What you're sh- what you're sharing, if I can um, make those distinctions, also is I think your the, the prepared 500 isn't isn't a, a fertility input. It's a it's a biological stimulant. It's an inoculant of types. Absolutely. I mean, it has no fertilization in a, uh, properties at all in it. We use. 35 grams of this substance which would be about the size of a a squash ball something like that um for for one whole acre of land so yeah it's it's a soil activator soil enlivener there's no doubt about that um and it's the foundation for the for the biodynamic method in conjunction with so the other good basic farming practices that some some we've touched on yeah and i on on the point of the of a biological stimulant i really would like to to touch on that a little bit, slightly more because more more and more we are seeing certainly as regenerative farming is becoming more in the mainstream soil scientists uh, are publishing more research and there's a growing interest suddenly in this thing called um living soils that you know like you're saying before the observation that soils are a living entity is now finally become a mainstream um understanding and i w- was interested again in touching on what you said before like what what are your th- thoughts on the the surge in interest in these biological stimulants be it inoculants compost teas vermicompost um be them made on site or bought in from from companies look it certainly there's no doubt it's a much better route than conventional agriculture is on at the moment. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's interesting you mention all all of those things, and I take the approach. And you know, you you've been to one of our sort of introductory days. I generally take the approach. It's not my job to convince anyone to to farm biodynamically. And I guess that's why I still really like the biodynamics because there's nothing to sell. So the, the, the prepared 500 costs our farmers about a dollar an acre. That's, that's, well, that would be considered our main input. The other products I've got nothing against. You know, every farmer is on their own, their own journey. I will argue against compost uh, and compost being made on farm, I, I can sort of put forth things against that in a purely practical nature. Um, but look, I, I think the main thing is with all of those other products that are available and farmers coming from a conventional system is that that, that change has come within the consciousness of the individual farmer himself. And so that's why I say it, I don't consider it my job to convince anyone to farm biodynamically. But when they've consciously come to that decision themselves, then it's my job to assist them where possible. Let's let's dive into that topic of compost slightly because in, in the small cal, small-scale farming community, often just due to the fact that real estate on the farm is so limited – often farmers being anywhere between half an acre to two, two acres compost is relied upon as a, as a main input um, and many rely on a, a deep compost system for maintaining fertility weed suppression etc cetera, etc cetera. so i would love to hear your thoughts on on compost and why which you have hinted at before why cover cropping is a far superior means of of feeding of feeding your plants okay look i can talk from the 
perspective of Australia here. Um, one issue I guess I've had is I've never, I'll, I'll talk about, I really have to consider on farm made compost. So I'll, I'll split, I'll, I'll split the two different types of compost up on farm versus bought in. Um, bought in compost, I've never seen a clean one in respect to the amount of heavy metals that it has. And I have problem, even certi certified organic compost in Australia have admissible levels of heavy metal content. I have problem with consciously bringing in a substance that's as cumulative as uh, some of those substances can be. They're not a colloidal product. So in essence, they still release the elements, uh, elements in a water-soluble fashion. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's sort of the reasons I'm not. I don't consider compost a, a giving back in the sense that a green manure crop is with that connection to the soil, that biomass created for the biology to create or to, to um, convert. I, I see the two processes as almost chalk and cheese. The, I guess the situation with on-farm composts that are made on farm, um, I see from a big picture there's the, the labour and costs involved in, in getting the material and building the heap. I'll use, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll just run a scenario by, so I, if I'm going to build a compost heap, I can get 10 tonnes of manure. I can um, take all the time, the energy to mix it with other materials to make the compost. Um, some people turn it, some don't. The size of that heap goes down dramatically through the maturation process of the compost converting. Quite often it'll just convert to broken down organic matter. Um, again, from a BD perspective, highly water soluble. So what you end up with out of that 10 tonne of manure is maybe four or five tonne of a compost heap and that might get spread over, I don't know, a quarter of an acre. In a biodynamic sheet composting system with using that 10 tonne of manure through a green manure crop and building the humus in situ, I can use that 10 tonne of cow manure essentially over a five acre area. Um, we call it sheet composting because we would, we would take that 10 tonne of cow manure and spread it. And um, grow a green manure through that with 500 and build the humus in situ. So on a, on a smaller scale, I think there's still room for quick green manure crops in farms that may be two acres or so small where the, the real estate may be at a premium. I just think that with what I've seen, that that activity of the root action with what it does to the soil with letting the soil biology create that humus in situ um, provides a long-term better option for any market gardener. That's a really considered answer, and I am, I am glad to see that over the last couple of years there's a lot more talk in the small-scale movement, like you're saying, suggesting that it is possible definitely um, to be including a lot more mixed cover cropping in the system um, and people getting a little bit more creative on how they incorporate um, and manage those those cover crops or green manures as you're saying yeah look i'll, I'll make a sorry Another, one, one just one quick comment yeah. and I've, I'm, I'm always talking on about roots and i still maintain in a green manure crop what's going on underneath is essentially more important than what's going on on top and in that small situation you don't need to grow a green manure that's Four foot high. I mean, if you uh, if you observe what happens in under the ground, again, I can't help digging, and I've got big interest in seed. So, for instance, by the time you see 
the cotyledons of a bean seed, you've got roots six, eight inches deep. So you can grow that green manure to a foot high and still have massive, massive benefits to the soil. And so it gives you a way to get it into the system in a shorter space of time. And it's important that that, that, that green manure is chopped up before being incorporated, chopped up into as small pieces as possible, giving the, the soil biology the quickest chance to consume it, and then you, you're back into the, the planting again. I'd, I'd encourage people to put it in a rotation. It's a really practical advice, which I really appreciate, because a lot of the, the, the common talk about cover cropping often mention about waiting until it gets to a certain amount of flowering to optimise the the, the most amount of, as you're saying, either biomass return or, or nutrient availability. But the point you're making is essentially if roots are in the soil, humus is being created and we're getting, as, we're getting biomass at any stage. So why not, why not start growing as many, as many green manures as you can possibly with inside a rotation? I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I mean, you've got that humus formation if you've got the, if you've got the BD bi- or the biology. So, of course, in my, in my instance where it's larger scale, so every time we sow a green manure, it's at least five acres. Um, I certainly do look for other signs um, as to when I'm going to work it in. And some seasons, I just yesterday, some of the green manure, I took the top off. I, all I do when I'm sowing is present a whole mix of species and let nature make the choice. And even within within just sowing five acres of green manure, you'll see different species predominate in different areas. Um, and you know, with the mix of species I have, sometimes if perhaps some of the legumes or whatnot are slow to get away, I might just zip across the top with the mulcher, um, take the top off some of the other species that are in there, and let the other stuff that's a bit lower down have a good push through so there's lots lots of different management tools and different approaches to to green manuring or cover cropping as if yeah also like you're saying I, i think sometimes our our ability to imagine and manage things is sometimes limited by what tools are available. And I know that certainly when it comes to cultivation, at least in the, the no-till movement, a lot of people have been, you know, look at some of the large attractors using heavy roto-tilling and, and, and seeing that as the main tool of cultivating and being obviously quite, uh, I, think, I think being quite aware of what damage can go along when you're using such, um, I think, uh, intense cultivation things like the rototiller ah uh, bloody terrible yeah and i know that the bd community yourself have have been using a, a plow which you call the rehabilitator and i'd love for you to share why that was created and what essentially it does in cultivating that manages to conserve the soil a lot more than something like a rotary plow yes well look any power driven implement rotary hose rotary plows power harrows I mean, they operate that severely that they smash any soil structure that you may have or may have been there to dust. Um, that gets rained on, it compacts down. Then the next time they cultivate it, they cultivate up rocks <laughs> and smash them down again with a power implement. I mean, it's it's devastating to any soil and it's devastating to see. I mean, I'm not sure how uh, someone that could be considered a farmer would undertake such action to the soil, but any cultivation implements we use are all tined implements. We don't use any power-driven tools at all. The plough that you talk about called the rehabilitator um, is a ripper to relieve compaction. I should mention when we're looking at relieving compaction, it's very the condition of the soil when you're doing that is very important. We're looking to have the soil quite dry because you're looking to get a, a shattering action. So the rehabilitator has a a specific shape tine on it that it just lifts the soil profile. 
as you know, you can plow down deep to to 50 centimeters with it, but it lifts the soil profile um, rather than inverting it, so to speak. It does have these two gentle sort of what we call tusk rollers on the back that can just work the top of the soil into a little bit finer tilth for, for sowing your green manure crop or whatever. Um, this implement's very ergonomic to pull because with the shape of the tine, the, the points underneath have lifted the soil profile before what we call the shank of the plough or the shank of the tine comes through. So it's a, a very useful implement in aerating the soil. And then any other implements we use after that, like I say, are, are tined implements which just gently lift and, and fracture the soil along its natural fracture line. So with the soil built by, built by biology and structured by roots, it'll just break up and crumble very gently um, into smaller aggregates. And that would be the, the maximum cultivation that we would do. We would never then go through and destroy that soil structure with a power-driven implement. Is that when are you using the plow in the sense, um, are you mowing down cover crops and then incorporating it using the rehabilitator or is there another implement you're doing? And then at what stage are you spraying the prepared 500? Yep, yep. So let's just say we've had a, a summer cropping season. Um, we're at the stage now where we've built our bank of humus that we can get probably three cash crops out of a piece of ground before we have to um, green manure again. But we would, let's say we're at, the, at that stage, we've grown our last crop and it's a summer crop. We'll use the rehabilitator plough. We'll, okay, we'll mulch up the summer crops and use the rehabilitator plough to plough the, the land. We'll just go one way. Um, then when we're going to expect a bit of an autumn break, so with growing vegetables, I've got some water that I grow vegetables with, but as far as growing green manure goes, I'm a, a dry land farmer, so I can only grow green manures over winter, um, reliant upon autumn and, and winter rainfall. And indeed, with it's important I'll just mention here, with working in a green manure, the water management after that is critical as well in hoping that there's enough rain follow working it in to maintain the soil biology to a point where that actually gets converted to humus. So that's an issue here sometimes um, with our climate. But we'll, we'll, we'll come out of a cropping situation, use the rehabilitator plough. If we decide we need any input, we'll put it on at this stage and that may be a very small amount of manure uh, ideally cow manure and always from another biodynamic property and we'll use a bit of rock dust um, we use a mixture of basalt and granite um, rock dust is of course non-water soluble but it's it's converted as well by soil biology and um, they create that water-soluble element out of the non-water-soluble rock dust and deposit it in the humus. That's also one of their functions. So we'll put a, any input on we think may be necessary at, at that stage. Um, we'll sow the green manure crop. As soon as we've got enough rain, we'll then um, spray the prepared 500 so it works as much as possible in conjunction with the root growth. Um, very important that 500 works with an activity. And the two activities it works with the best is in root growth, in structuring the soil, and in the conversion of organic matter into humus. So we sow the green manure, spray the prepared 500, chop that green manure up when it's ready, um, we cultivate it in with the rehabilitator plough as well. 
because the tusk rollers it has on the back is extremely good at working in the green manure um, and they're self-cleaning on the way out so they just, they just gently work the green manure material into the top four to, four to six inches of the soil then we spray prepared 500 again once we've worked the green manure in so we're looking to do it a couple of times a year and that they're, they're the times as a market gardener that i'm looking to to apply the 500 and that, that's our basic well that is our fertility program the rock dust manure green manure and prepared 500 so we don't add any out of the bag fertilizers or import any composts in um to that mix it's really exciting hearing you share all those things and um a lot of people talk and aspire to be able to farming to farm in a way which is a, a much more closed loop system and it's amazing that i you know i have been to your farm i have i've seen your your produce and other bd growers in australia and i've always been incredibly um surprised and heartened by the the, the quality and the taste which, like you were saying before, the proof is in the pudding, and the practical, the practical methods that that you undertake are are really giving you that feedback, not only in healthy crops but also flavour and an incredible, incredible name for your community in the uh, in the in the scene back here. Yeah, that that flavour, sorry, that I'll just interrupt. That flavour um, essentially stems from the way the plants are fed as well, with avoiding the water soluble, the soluble salts. That's certainly a major part in the flavour attainable in some of our produce. Is this something that you're you're noting year after year? You're, you're, as your soil improves, there are flavour profiles that are coming in and, and improving as well? Most definitely. And look, I can say that this is one of the things that still amazes me with biodynamics, that um, each year I actually consider my soil is getting better um, each year, I consider less and less bringing in any input, even if it's minuscule medicinal amounts of, of just rock dust. The yeah, the flavour, I, I tend to take it a bit for granted, Mikey. But the the people that I know that give me the feedback say the the flavour and the depths of the flavour is is continuing to. To improve um, and look our production I'm not a, not really inclined to talk figures too much but our production pretty close to uh, a heavily fertilized conventional system which is which is what you're sharing is essentially a super important element of, of all farming growing growing a beautiful product but not having a viable business um, doesn't serve anyone and it's uh it's remarkable to hear that obviously the business side of things are going well and a part of what i wanted to chat about at the last step of our interview was a little bit about those sales and distributions which i know in the community that you're a part of uh is is served by an amazing non-for-profit the biodynamic marketing co which essentially enables yourself and many other growers to spend a lot more of their time in the field observing growing and improving themselves as farmers and letting the marketing and the sales to other people yeah well you know alex had amazing foresight in the way he set this up you know we the way we operate as i mentioned farmer to farmer free of charge we just call it our time bank and um all of our organizations are non-profit organizations so yeah look I guess in the mid 70s 20 odd years after the method had started here and the farming organization had started there was a necessity to be able to have recognition of and distribute the bd produce that more and more people were were after so not only did alex educate farmers here and around the world he educated consumers here as well so yeah we have the biodynamic marketing company we essentially consider that we all own it um it's there for us it's there to get the best price it can 
for us as farmers and it does look after a lot of the marketing. While, while it's a, a registered non-profit company, it obviously makes some money, but that money it invests back into projects on biodynamic farms, the, the width and breadth um, of Australia. So it, it's, it's a win-win situation. Uh, so we're very we're very lucky with the situation we've got, and um, I've been lucky enough to travel a bit re regards this BD work, and what we've actually got here is unique um, setup. I've not seen it replicated anywhere else uh, so far. Completely, and I we have a one of our, our sister podcast, um, the collaborating talks a lot about collaborative farming and has been interviewing a lot of farmers in the states and abroad relating to their collaborative farms uh, community projects relating to essentially supporting and utilizing the resources that we have at hand together to grow better and it's it's really beautiful to see how your community comes together um, is driven so much by wanting to see this this method grow not in a profitizing way but in a way which is uh which is, is, is shared and considered. And I also know that as a community, you've been doing some work um, across farms in seed seed producing and, and breeding to better support biodynamic seed production. Could you share a few words about that as well? Yeah, sure. Look, there's not much of a, not much of a or let's just say or, organic for the moment, seed industry in Australia. A lot of our seeds imported um so myself and another fella another bd market gardener have always had a long interest in seed so we've developed partnerships with um a couple of companies and organizations in the states and some in europe um we have founded the biodynamic seed company where we have um biodynamic market gardeners and farmers in Australia growing new uh, open pollinated market standard uh, varieties. So it's a, only started a couple of years ago. Um, we've now got seed uh, that we also we sell on to other other companies. And yeah, it's, it's an important initiative in maintaining the power and choices of, of the farmer. I mean, we could go into, would be another whole podcast on the eye opener of how the conventional seed industry actually works. <laughs> and look, there's a lot, um, a lot of issue regards genetic engineering technology, the watering down of um, regulations. In, in certain areas and with um, hybrid crops with this CRISPR technology it's a genetic manipulation technology um, it's going to be very very hard for organic farmers to buy any sort of hybrid seed that in the eventually that's not genetically engineered so it's important that we develop in this industry here in Australia um, we saw what happened last year with a few little hiccups around the world, how quickly the seed stocks dried up and a lot of Australian companies found that out from an economic perspective with not being able to get seed from overseas. Um, so yeah, we've just taken it upon ourselves to start another project and try and firm up a good quality open pollinated seed source here you know i think darren we, we may actually have to have you on the podcast again to explore all these extra topics so be prepared for an email in the next uh in the next couple of months i reckon yeah i'm just looking at the time now and going geez it's almost time for a beer i mean not where you are i hope but where i am and yeah i i feel we've only just scratched many surfaces <laughs> Well, if you're keen for another chat, you just let me know and we'll arrange it. And, and before we sign off, I just wanted to um, give you the opportunity maybe to, maybe to give any, any last-minute words to people listening in who, who are interested in stepping closer towards um, 
either farming in a biodynamic method or stepping towards reduced inputs on their farm, what would you suggest are the initial steps that they should be taking? Well, look, if anyone wants to get deeper into the BD, I'd be um, looking at results that are got with the, the, the people that you're, you're going to deal with. I mean, we've got farmers practicing our method, certainly in many European countries, many Asian countries. Um, we got a bit of contact with a couple of guys from America. One guy particularly from America um, has come over and been given training in making the, the preps and whatnot. So, you know, I guess if anyone was, was really keen, there's all also possibilities of direct links. Um, I don't know how we'd set it up. We'd have to discuss it. But we can put people in touch with farmers practising in, in different areas as well. But look at the result. Don't listen to the talk. That's my <laughs> – that's the bottom line. That's great advice. Um Darren, thanks so much for, for coming on and sharing your insights. It's always a it's always fantastic being challenged by the things you share, reflecting on my own farming practices and my trajectory in farming. Um, and I really have learned so much over the years from tapping into the resources that yourself and the BD community have been very generous in in sharing and communicating. So thanks a lot. And like I said, go go grab yourself a cold beer and um Maybe let's tee up a, another chat in a couple of months. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. All right, mate. Appreciate it. All right. If you enjoyed that episode and you're enjoying our Southern Hemisphere series, make sure to check out the show notes for all the links as well as how to follow our guests and how to follow our host, Mikey Densham. Consider signing up to be a patron at patreon.com slash no till growers or just check out no till growers.com for more ways to support our work. This episode was produced by Mikey Densham with help from no till growers. Big thanks to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.